Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Soloway. I may have met you or not. I'm the rheumatologist, and um, vasculitis is a um, scary topic to talk about. I don't know about it, you don't know about it, none of us know about it. But um, my goal is to at least explain it in a way so that everybody can take home a feeling that it's not so scary, that you'll know how to at least classify it, that you'll understand what you're looking for, you'll understand what are some key findings, you'll understand when the word comes up that you really don't need to panic. Um, key physical findings, um, board-related situations, there's a lot to it, but if it's explained properly, and I've had a long time to listen to many people lecture, I think it can be explained so that you can leave today and at least make some sense of it. And since it'll be on YouTube, if you want to rewatch it, it may make more sense, but then again, my mistakes may be more pronounced. This is a possibility. Um, I try not to look at the slides, and I try to give all these lectures looking at the audience. This is a difficult lecture for me, and I probably will be referring to my slides, just because we have so much information to cover. So, with that being said, I do have a copy of my slides to cheat from. And again, thanks to Matt for helping me set up PowerPoint, because I am probably the only physician in the hospital that does not know how to use a computer. And it's not something on my radar to learn soon. Okay, um, Matt, let's go ahead to two slides. Yeah, that's the slide. Okay, um, so <clears throat> the overview of vasculitis is how to classify it. The classification scheme of vasculitis has changed three, four, five times in the last 20 years. Polyarteritis nodosa was the first vasculitic disease described in the 1800s. And vasculitis means blood vessel inflammation. I feel that the best way to classify it, and this actually goes along with the 2013 New American College of Rheumatology vasculitic um, nomenclature would be small, medium, and large vessel disease. By contrast, 10 years ago, it was a category for granulomatous diseases, which would have included Wegner's granulomatosis, vasculitis from Crohn's disease, which could have fallen into the small or medium vessel disease, giant cell arteritis with granulomas, which would fall into the large vessel disease. So 10 years ago, we had a classification of granulomatous vasculitis. Today, we don't formally have that classification. That being said, I don't really want anyone to get hung up on the classification. I want everyone to understand that a disease can overlap with any other disease and you can really classify it how you like. And as with any other topic that we discuss, in rheumatology, diseases are based upon criteria, and those criteria are used for a research population. So if I tell you that the criteria for Church-Strauss syndrome, which by the way is no longer called Church-Strauss syndrome in the 2013 literature, if I say, you have to have an eosinophil count of 1,500 in a chronic worsening asthmatic with vasculitis of two separate areas of their body. Well, if you took the same person and they had vasculitis in one part of their body, or they had an eosinophil count of 1,400, well, they don't qualify for the research criteria. But more than likely, they probably have church stress syndrome, or what is now called um, eGPA, or eosinophilic, granulomatous poly polyangiitis, and I will get to that when we discuss the nomenclature that is behind me. Um, okay, so 
So this is partially the way I like to do it, and this is partially um, uh, protocol, I guess. There's a lot of things left out, but I purposely uh, picked some things that I, I thought are important for residents, that I, I think they're important for board exams. I think they're important that even if you don't know what these diseases are, that you've heard of them and that you can have something to build upon. So small vessel vasculitis. Last year, there used to be four primary small vessel vasculitic diseases. It was hemop schoenlein purpura, it was cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, urticarial vasculitis, also known as hypocomplementemic vasculitis, and hypersensitivity vasculitis, typically due to sulfur-related products such as uh, thiazides, Lasix, allopurinol, and by the way, there are many, many, many sulfur-related drugs that cause vasculitis, okay? Now, that was the old nomenclature, and I used to like that nomenclature because I could just remember those four diseases. So in 2013, they kind of changed the nomenclature, and this partially has to do with um, the discovery of ANCA, which um, I'm not good on years in the history of vasculitis, but I think it was um, 2005 and 2008, or 1995 and 1998, when ANCA was discovered and described and talked about. And then there became a topic of ANCA-related vasculitis. And the good news about ANCA vasculitis is that because now that there was a blood test that you could link to a condition, it is a little bit easier, rather than flying by the seat of your pants, you can say, oh, uh, 20 organ systems are failing and their ANCA is really high, so they must have vasculitis. Well, that's partially true, but anyway, for diagnostic purposes, in 2013, the ANCA diseases, they're in the small vessel category, okay? So, Hennock Schoenlein purpura is no longer. It's now referred to as IgA vasculitis. Um, Wegner's granulomatosis is no longer a term. It is now granulomatous polyangiitis. Microscopic PAN, which is a p anca disease, which is the myeloperoxidase component, that is um, microscopic polyangiitis. We still have cryoglobulin-related vasculitis, uh, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. Um, Henoch Schoenlein purpura is now IgA vasculitis. Okay, so this being said, um, I'll say something about small vessel vasculitis. The one thing about small vessel vasculitis that would lead you, oh, and the one thing that's not there that's very important is the drug-induced category, the hypersensitivity. So please, just because it's not on this slide, it's extremely important. It's probably more common than everything else. So somebody comes in the emergency room and you're called to see them for diffuse palpable purpura, the first thing you want to know, is there an allergy or a drug reaction? And that's, that's going to be the answer more than half the time. These things are rare. As common as they may sound currently, they're not common. So if I have 12 of these in my practice, that's a lot. But for every 12 of these, we have 100 that have a drug-induced vasculitis. And I could probably think of uh, 20 drugs that commonly cause vasculitis that are not uncommon for, for doing that. And um, one, one mention, at least for uh, board exams, is if somebody has thiazide or Lasix allergy and can't take sulfadiuretic, um, I hope you guys know that et epicrinic acid or etocrine is the alternate of choice that is used in sulfa-sensitive people, and I'm sure that will be on boards either this time or next time or sometime. So anyway, just get that out there. Okay, so now, then we have medium vessel. That, oh, I'm sorry, back to small vessel. What I want you to know about small vessel is small vessels are in the skin. So small vessel vasculitis can, of course, present in any fashion. But if you see a peculiar rash, particularly palpable purpura, you at least need to think, gee, this patient may have vasculitis. Now, these are all primary vasculitic diseases. There's also, there's also secondary vasculitic diseases. 
Um, I believe there's a slide about it, but again, we've already established that I'm not good with slides. So since I'm on a roll, I'm gonna tell you now, some of the mimics of small and medium vessel vasculitis that you'd think of if you had palpable purpura. The reason I'm focusing on palpable purpura, and I'll caveat it by telling you that not all palpable purpura is vasculitis. So you still may need a biopsy. So you see palpable purpura, you get a biopsy, and they do immunofluorescence and you see IgA, well that's IgA vasculitis. You do uh, the same biopsy and you get IgG and IgM uh, and you get C3 and C4, that's probably lupus. Hey, wait a minute, lupus isn't up there. Well, that's an autoimmune disease where you can have a secondary vasculitis. So you can have, for small vessel disease or medium or large, you can have secondary vasculitic diseases, okay? And those include malignancies, they include um, autoimmune diseases, they include um, Crohn's, sarcoid, granulomatous diseases. So there's three categories in addition to the primary small vessel diseases that often present with funky rashes or palpable purpura, and sometimes you simply must get a biopsy. Medium vessel vasculitis. Um, I'd love to know what some of these mean, but I'm gonna first tell you that eGPA should go in the small vessel category because eGPA is what used to be called um, Church-Strauss syndrome. Uh, <laughs> apologize. Sorry about that. Remember, don't ever bring your phone. Okay, so eGPA, this is eosinophilic granulomatous polyangiitis. So now, I've just told you, there's no more Wegner's, there's no more microscopic PAN, there's no more henoch schonlein purpura, and now there's no more Church-Strauss syndrome. So you've just come here and found out that four diseases that you always heard about are gone. But you know what? In five years, maybe it'll change back. Who knows? Does everyone know that um, in limited scleroderma, there's no such name as crest anymore, even though people use the word all the time? So there's no more crest, even though everyone uses the name. And I'm sure people are still going to use the wrong names. It's the vasculitis opathist who's going to be very hung up on the name. Um, but it, it's actually a kind of good classification system, system because the granulomatous polyangiitis, they all have to do with ANCA, and they all are small vessel diseases. So the EPGA belongs over here, okay? The prototype of all vasculitis is really polyangiitis nodosa. The other important one that I had for this list, this should be P instead of I, primary CNS vasculitis. Uh, I don't know what BACC is. Matt, do you know what BACC was supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know. And uh, Kawasaki's disease is a medium vessel disease of children. That's the so-called mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. I'm not a pediatrician, I have not seen a case, but they get this strawberry tongue that's a good board thing. They ask you about a strawberry tongue and a two-year-old with a high fever and all kind of vasculitic manifestations, which we're going to discuss after. Um, but the ones I really want you to know about, and the important one, is really PAN, okay? A typical PAN patient, that's the patient. This is sort of confusing because there's no blood test for PAN. It's not an ANCA disease. It's not an IgA disease. It's not a lupus disease. There's no immunofluorescence. There's simply manifestations of vasculitis. Okay, doc, what are manifestations of vasculitis? You know, you know rash, hair loss, what, what's vasculitis? How do we know it's vasculitis and not lupus or, or cancer or lymphoma or something else? Well, the interesting thing about PAN 
but again, medium vessel disease, and I'm going to describe some of the differences of medium vessel symptoms versus small vessel symptoms. So a typical person with PAN, and I have had two come in the last three weeks. One walked in with foot drop, one walked in with wrist drop, okay? So has anyone heard of mononeuritis multiplex? Mono is one, neuritis is the inflamed nerve, and multiplex implies that there's often more than one. So for the purposes of our discussion, and I think this is quite well accepted, if you have a nameable nerve, the, um, uh, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, or the perineal nerve. So if you have a perineal nerve neuritis, you have foot drop. If you have a radial nerve problem, you have wrist drop. Um, ulnar nerve is claw hand. So these are just some examples of what would tip you off that a person has vasculitis. So let me say a couple of other things about PAN because that's our prototype of vasculitis and that's our most difficult thing to diagnose because there's no test. So if somebody has mononeuritis multiplex, immediately you know that the vessels are larger than small vessel disease, so you don't think about the small vessel category. And as your testing comes back, your ANA and DNA are negative, your ANCA testing is negative, your rheumatoid factor and your phospholipids are all negative. Your chemistry and your CBC and your urine, they're all negative. Hmm, the CBC and, and the urine are negative. Well, here, here's another stopping point, a teaching point about PAN. PAN actually spares the lungs and the kidneys. So, for those who think that PAN involved the kidneys, which is kind of a trick thing, but it's really not. It involves the renal arteries. So PAN patients present with extreme hypertension, but not because of glomerular disease. They present with extreme hypertension because of renal artery disease. And in that situation where you have somebody with wrist drop or foot drop who has hypertension, your first test should probably be a mesenteric arteriogram to look at the vessels to see if they have typical findings of vasculitis in those vessels in the mesentery. You can also do uh, MRA, you can do CTA, or you can do a dye angiogram. You can do the mesentery, you can do the celiac, you can do the aorta, there's many parts of the body and vessels that can be imaged. But in PAN, we're looking at the medium-sized vessels such as the mesentery or the celiac plexus. So, no kidney involvement, but severe hypertension related to renal arteries. No lung involvement. All the other diseases give lung involvement. And there's a couple of um, pulmonary renal syndromes, which I will get to later on, so that you'll see that there's a couple that really overlap, and you have to distinguish them on biopsy. Um, so can we go back? Mm -hmm. I just went to that for a while. Okay. I'm um, very easy to confuse. It's been a long day. So, um, all right, so PAN, medium vessels, mononeuritis multiplex, no lungs, no kidneys, but blood vessel involvement. So if we talk about, let's say, the gut, if a patient has one of these conditions of the gut, small vessel, what would you expect them to have? You'd expect them to have bowel wall edema because they don't have a big enough vessel to cause a bowel wall infarction or bleeding. But on the flip side, if you have somebody with PAN, they might present with a GI bleed. They might present with a gastric ulcer. They might present with a colon bleed. They're not going to just present with pain. They could present with an appendicitis with, with um, uh, an infarcted appendix. They might present with an infarcted gallbladder, but they're not going to present with small vessel features such as bowel wall edema. The bowel wall edema might be confused with lymphoma, but again, you're not going to get that bowel perforation or gangrene, which you'll get in PAN. So in PAN, 
you very well may find somebody with free air in, in the uh, abdominal cavity and have a surgical abdomen. If you have that, you don't have a small vessel disease. Hence, you probably don't have an anger related disease. There's a big difference there. And I know this is very confusing. And at the end of the lecture, we get back to the same slides to try to summarize it again. Okay. Um, large vessel diseases, the one that you all know about is giant cell arteritis. So, giant cell arteritis. It's by far the most common large vessel vasculitis. It involves the aorta and all of its branches and the branches that lead to the skull and the brain. So ominous findings are related to central nervous system, predominantly or, uh, or most fearsome would be um, blindness. So if somebody has temporal artery tenderness with blurred vision, this person might have giant cell arteritis. You'd expect them to have elevated acute phase reactants, high set rate, high C-reactive protein. If it's been going on a few months, you might expect them to be anemic. But there's no test for this. So the ranka, it may be positive, it may be negative. If it's positive, it's not helpful. If it's negative, it's, it doesn't matter, it's consistent. The ANA in, in a 70 or 80 year old, which is the group of people getting this, it's usually positive at 40 or 80 in, in that population anyway, so it's of no value. The problem you need to worry about is if you see somebody who you think has giant cell arteritis and they have a really peculiar blood test that steers you to something else. So you have to focus very clear on your history. The most symptom for giant cell arteritis, in fact, is jaw claudication or ischemia to the tongue. So tongue and jaw claudication, trouble chewing, cramping of the tongue. The, if, if you have a patient who describes those symptoms and they're over 55 years old, they probably have giant cell arteritis. Now, the other common thing, of course, and the one we want to protect is against blindness. So you can have aortic involvement with any aortic uh, complications, whether it be dissection or aneurysms, you can have subclavian, brachial artery, you can have vertebral artery, you can have neurologic findings on the basis of the posterior uh, vertebral circulation, the cerebellum findings. So really nothing's off the table. So it's got to be a diagnosis that you suspect, and this is important. The other thing that's important to know is when examining somebody for temporal arteritis, and I'm purposely not talking about um, polymyalgia rheumatica, which is seen in a large percentage of um, giant cell arteritis patients, is because polymyalgia rheumatica, while it's associated with, is not a vasculitic disease. I would consider it a rheumatologic mimic involving the proximal girdles. But um, back to giant cell arteritis. Um, when this happens. Temporal okay. artery biopsy or anything like that? Ah, the exam of the temporal arteries. You have to feel the pulse. If you put your hands where the temporal artery should be and you don't feel a pulse, this is very bad. So the first thing is you must feel a pulse. The second thing, the artery is abnormal if it's indurated or tender. So if you touch the artery and you say, sir, is that where your pain is? Oh yeah, that's what hurts. They probably do have temporal arteritis. We actually had a patient in the office last week who has psoriatic arthritis, who came in and said, I have a headache. How long have you had it? I've had it a week or two. First time you've ever had it? Yes, first time. Can you show me where it is? Yeah, it's right here. So the guy's about 75. I've treated him for a long time for psoriatic arthritis. He's on methotrexate. He's doing very well. I think he's also on a biologic, Remicade or Umera, for his psoriatic arthritis. So I thought, oh, this is amazing. But why is he getting, um, why is he getting these symptoms? Well, the first thing to know 
is that giant cell arteritis is only treated with prednisone. You can't wean somebody from prednisone and hope that methotrexate is going to work. And any studies of biologic drugs, such as Remicade and Humira, they do not work for giant cell arteritis. So therefore, it, it makes perfect sense that this particular person may have two diseases. So today as blood work came back, and while I'm somebody that advocates not paying attention to set rates or CRPs, this guy who came in with a left-sided unilateral headache and no other symptoms had a set rate of 130, which was the highest limit that that lab allowed, and a very high C-reactive protein. And in fact, when I examined him, what, what sold me on the diagnosis and why I treated him immediately was he did have a tender temporal artery. Um, the typical ophthalmologic finding is ischemic optic neuritis, and that's something you'd have to send the patient to an ophthalmologist for. But since this disease is an emergency, you, you don't have time to do these things. So if you suspect temporal arteritis, you have to start giving 60 or 80 milligrams of prednisone immediately to prevent the blindness or risk of stroke. You also treat uh, temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis with aspirin. It's been proven to be helpful to use an aspirin in addition to your treatment with high dose steroids. So how long do you treat the steroids? You treat with high dose steroids, meaning um, 60 or 80 milligrams a day or one to two milligrams per kilogram for probably about three, four or five weeks until all the symptoms are gone. Then you gradually wean the steroids. The amount of time that you'll have to wean the steroids can vary three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. And then of course you take into consideration all the steroid side effects, the GI protection, the bone protection, the cholesterol protection, the diabetic protection, etc. But clearly you can manage those problems rather than letting your patient go blind or die. So like they said in med school, if you think LP, do LP. If you think somebody has temporal arteritis, don't call me. Start prednisone and then call me. It's the most important thing you can do. You'll save their life, you'll save them from going blind. And furthermore, it's pretty well recognized that if you have somebody who has temporal arteritis, and perhaps you're not sure, but you give them high dose steroids for a week, by doing that, you've eliminated their risk of developing <clears throat> blindness or stroke by in the upper 90%, 95, 98%. So once you've hit them hard with high dose steroids for even a week, their risk of going blind or getting a stroke from um, that condition is negligible. It's possible, but negligible. So getting back to uh, further trying to diagnose the condition, the definitive diagnosis is biopsy. And the proper way to do the biopsy, although I don't often get it done properly because no people do it that way, is you're supposed to do bilateral biopsies and you're supposed to get two centimeter lesions because the lesions are called skip lesions like they are in Crohn's disease. You need a nice long piece of, of uh, artery, you need internal elastic lamina stain, and you need um, a really good pathologist to look for giant cells and problems or thickening of the internal elastic lamina. And I'll throw in uh, one point of um, informative news. Uh, there's a percentage, probably 10% of people who have classic giant cell arteritis have amyloid on their biopsy and not giant cells and not vasculitis. And those people don't do well. But you should know that that is a very common mimic of giant cell arteritis, even though it's not seen very, um, not seen very commonly. Perhaps it's overlooked, perhaps we don't look for it enough. Perhaps the pathologists don't see it. Perhaps the surgeons who refuse to do the second side, who are scared of the complication of scalp necrosis, uh, aren't getting us what we need. But if you think it, you treat it. And that's, and, and the reason I'm spending so much time on giant cell arteritis, it is the most common vasculitic disease, period. So um, if there had to be a question on the board exam or any board exam, about vasculitis, it'll be about giant cell arteritis because that's the most common one. And I did mention polymyalgia rheumatica before. Polymyalgia rheumatica 
which is associated with a third of the people with giant cell arteritis, is a, I'll call it a rheumatoid mimic. I'll pretend that it's rheumatoid arthritis of the muscles involving the proximal girdles. Neck and shoulder, hip and bud, muscular, severe morning stiffness, severe debilitating pain, exquisitely sensitive to steroids, even low dose, 10 milligrams, 15, 20 milligrams. Another situation that could arise, and this is more of a clinical judgment than it, than it would be a board example, somebody comes to you and they describe this horrible pain syndrome, neck and shoulders, hips and butt, they worse in the morning for an hour, it's new, it started a month or two or three months ago, you give them 10 or 20 milligrams of prednisone, they didn't get better. What do you do next? Well, you're kind of stuck. No, not really. You can say, well, I think they have a form for us of giant cell arteritis. Raise the prednisone to 60 or 80, and they should get better the next day. And if that's the case, even if you don't have a biopsy, that patient has giant cell arteritis. Okay? So we're gonna move on to some other topics. I just wanna go through this list, which I think comes back again later in the talk. Um, on the other list, the other list is listed because, oh, I'll just say two words about Takayasu's aortitis, okay? So if no one's heard of Takayasu's aortitis, Takayasu's aortitis, like every other vasculitic disease, is typically more common in women than men, and it's more common in Japan, hence Dr. Takayasu who discovered it. Um, typically involves the large vessels, it can be asymptomatic and present with pulseless, di pulseless disease or lack of pulses, or you can also have presentation with aneurysms uh, and catastrophic events from large vessels, uh, whether it be dissecting aneurysm, ruptured aneurysms, exsanguinating from aneurysms, um, there's involvement of the lungs, um, pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary infarction, these are all features that you may see in Takayasu's, but what I'd like you to know is that one, it exists, two, it is a primary large vessel vasculitis, three, it's involved in Asia more than it is in the US, it involves large vessels starting with the aorta and can involve the pulmonary arteries, um, and can be asymptomatic in the form of pulse-less disease, which is, how it's often known as on the boards, where you simply don't feel pulses because there is a slide somewhere, and we may get to it, but I'll talk about it now just because. Um, two things can happen to arteries, whether they're small or large. And in the realm of vasculitis, they can either dilate or they can constrict. So if they constrict, you have stenosis. If you have stenosis, you don't get blood to the end organ, and if you don't get blood to the end organ, in the case of the lung, you will get um, a pulmonary infarction, which will lead to bleeding, which can be confused with the pulmonary embolus and many other mimics. Um, on the other side, you may have dilatation or an aneurysm. Well, if you get an aneurysm, you're also gonna have difficulty with flow. You may get leakage of blood, so there may be leaking blood or areas of hemorrhage, or again, lack of flow to the end organ. So stenosis will show up on the arteriogram as a stenotic lesion, and aneurysms will show up as beads or a beading phenomena. So these are something I can show you pictures of, but before we get to the pictures, and I, I apologize if I'm a little disorganized, this is not an easy topic. Um, I just want to go through the other category because I think this is very important. Because when people think of vasculitis, I think they should really be open-minded because no vasculitic disease is really its own disease. So, infective endocarditis. No way of distinguishing from vasculitis. Impossible. In, in endocarditis, you can have joint involvement, you can have blood vessel involvement, you can have low complements, you get high set rate, you get peculiar rashes, you get splenic infarctions, you get strokes. No way of distinguishing. So you need a good history, as you do with everything else, you need a good history. 
somebody had a dental procedure and they didn't use dental prophylaxis three weeks later they're having a prodrome they're not feeling well they're having fevers sweats unexplained weight loss they're not trying to lose weight they they just don't feel good they show up in the er with a blue toe if you get that history it's not too hard to lump together that you need blood cultures right away in an echo okay second cholesterol emboli Cholesterol emboli usually occurs after a uh, invasive cardiac procedure, such as a cardiac cath. It can occur from the same day until about 30 days out. So this can be 30 days out after um, a, um, a cardiac cath. People throw cholesterol to the fingers or toes. So again, it looks like vasculitis. You see purple toes. Well, interestingly enough, low complements, elevated eosinophils, not vasculitis, cholesterol emboli. The way to tell the difference, the history, and the biopsy of cholesterol clefts in the biopsy. The treatment, good luck. Calciphylaxis, violaceous plaques across the abdomen in fatty structures, so the belly, the flanks, this occurs, and it mimics vasculitis as well, in dialysis patients with a prolonged elevated calcium uh, phosphate product. Mostly dialysis patients with prolonged elevated calcium phosphorus product. Come along tremendous, horrendous skin lesions that are violaceous plaques, and you should recognize that there it, is calciphylaxis and that this is an entity that can look like vasculitis but is not vasculitis. Next, um, Coumadin skin necrosis. Again, looks like vasculitis. The patient must start Coumadin and have a protein C deficiency and within three to five days they develop a horrific eruption that looks like vasculitis. Again, it's another thing to know, you stop the Coumadin. Endocarditis has been repeated twice, I apologize. And then the other one, which is the old mimic of lymphoma. Anybody who presents with a vasculitic syndrome that is somewhat unknown, you have to always think of a paraneoplastic syndrome. By far the most common would be lymphoma. Lymphoma can present as anything. I'll go so far to tell you, I've seen intravascular lymphoma, and that was diagnosed on an unknown fascinoma on somebody who actually ended up in desperation. We did a skin biopsy of normal skin and found intravascular lymphoma. Okay, so now we can go to the next slide. I like that slide, it bought me like a half an hour. Um, so kind of what I was saying before, uh, a lot of this I have gone through, so it's going to make the rest of this a little less painful. So vasculitis is blood vessel inflammation, there's blood vessel damage, and you can either have um, some, something wrong in the wall or out of the wall. Now I want to also explain the term vasculopathy as opposed to vasculitis. If somebody has phospholipid antibody syndrome and they have a thrombus and blood doesn't get by, clearly there's not going to be blood going to the distal organ and they may infarct the toe or whatever they may infarct. That's not vasculitis. That's a vasculopathy. There is an issue with the vessel. It's clogged, but it's not inflamed. Now you can have an inflamed vessel following an infarction or a thrombus, but it doesn't have to be that way. And so what, the, what this slide is actually meant to tell you is that, as I said before, if the, if the lumen narrows or becomes occluded because of inflammation, there's going to be end organ ischemia. Blue and black toes, bowel infarction, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, abdominal pain, blood in the urine, stroke, blindness, and any other organ system you want to throw in, something can go wrong. 
aneurysm or disruption of the vessel, you get leaking of the blood, you get hemorrhage. So it depends where this is happening that will decide what the fate is. So in the lung, if you have blood leaking everywhere, you'll have a pulmonary hemorrhage as opposed to a pulmonary infarction. And that's a pretty good example. Okay, next. All right. Um, so I think everybody is probably familiar with palpable purpura. If you haven't seen it, small red dots, typically in the de dependent areas of the body, can be on the arms, can be on the belly. But if this were a typical small vessel vasculitis, which now known as IgA vasculitis, or formerly hanok line purpura, you'd see this typical picture. You would do a biopsy, and the immunofluorescence would be positive for IgA. Now, since we mentioned hanok line purpura, or IgA vasculitis, it happens to be one of my favorite diseases. Um, it's a pentad. It's, and you know what? This pentad really applies for all vasculitic conditions to some degree, because multiple organ systems are involved. So in the pentad, you have a non-thrombocytopenic purpura. You have usually a unilateral uh, swollen knee, inflammatory fluid with no erosions, have intense abdominal pain, but again, edema. It's small vessel, no infarction. Um, you have the IgA deposition, but you also have IgA elevation in the serum. And you have uh, biopsy proof of vasculitis. Now, one term that I didn't mention yet is leukocytoclastic vasculitis. That term, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, is synonymous with small vessel vasculitis. This is white cells leaking out around the vessel and surrounding the vessel. So when you hear the term, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, or read that on a biopsy report, what you should say is, oh, they have small vessel vasculitis. It's of no specificity. It just tells you that, yes, they have vasculitis. Um, the biopsy shows, um, I actually thought that was supposed to be a nerve, but actually, so what this shows, here's the uh, lumen of the vessel, and here it's all clogged up. So clogged vessel, things don't get through, problems occur distal to that. Okay, next. Okay, so this is, um, again, things keep repeating themselves, and I'm doing that on purpose, because if I don't repeat these things, I don't think it's possible to walk out of here remembering all these things. So here's another way of looking at what I just told you already. So we have primary vasculitides. It means that's your disease. It's not caused by something else. So on the primary vasculitides, we have a nice list, but we're going to change the names for the 2013 nomenclature. But if you want to use these <coughs> names, that's OK, because nobody in the hospital knows the new nomenclature besides me and that. So, Giant cell arteritis still has the same name. It's treated with steroids. It's not responsive to methotrexate. It can cause stroke and blindness. Takeyasu's aortitis or arteritis, large vessels, usually Japanese, young women, no pulses, presents asymptomatic, or with aneurysms and horrific uh, cardiopulmonary manifestations, heart attack, pulmonary hemorrhage, or infarction. Kawasaki's is children, mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome with a strawberry tongue. We don't really need to know a whole lot about that, unless we have a peds person here and they know more about it than me. Polyarteritis nodosa, important things to know. And I didn't mention this before, so I'm glad we're back to this. We used to see a lot of this. When I was, when I was a, a fellow or a resident back, uh, <coughs> back in the Stone Age, um, we really did see a lot of this. And that's because this is associated with hepatitis B. So people with hepatitis B surface antigen have a very, or I should say, have a much higher incidence of PAN than not having hepatitis B surface antigen. And frankly, the people who have hepatitis B surface antigen, along with hepatitis B IgM core antibody, have the worst prognosis with or without epsilon antibody. And that's assuming there still is epsilon antibody, because I don't keep up with GI as much as I keep up with room. 
was supposed to laugh. That was like a little bit funny. Um, okay, so Wegner's is no longer called Wegner's. It is now GPA, like your grade point average. Do not forget this. So I want you to wow your attendings and tell them we had this great lecture to you guys is, again, PAM, high blood pressure from renal artery involvement, no glomerular involvement, the kidney is spared. That's different than all the other vasculitic diseases. I don't want anyone to leave here and not remember that. Um, diagnosis, clinical, biopsy, uh, sural nerve biopsy, site-specific biopsy, skin biopsy, angiogram. Typical angiogram findings, uh, dilatation with stenosis or beating. Beating is another way of saying aneurysms. Um, treatments, well, the good news and bad news about treatments, predominantly high dose steroids is the treatment. The bad news is we don't have a lot of other treatments. So I'm gonna be general a little bit here and tell you that you have, if you have a very sick vasculitic patient, the typical treatment, and, I, and I'm just generalizing now, small, medium, large, you pick your diagnosis, and there are exceptions to what I'm gonna say, but generally speaking, for a vasculitic patient, you're gonna start them off immediately with pulse steroids. So it's 1,000 milligrams of cyanometrol daily for three days. Generally very well tolerated, something that I probably prescribe once every two months for the last 25 years. Nothing that you should be afraid of, nothing you should worry about, and as long as it's not infused too fast, uh, I would say that some people will abuse it within an hour. I like to infuse it in two hours. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Um, giving a fourth dose has never been shown to be better than a third dose. I'm not sure how they came up with three doses as the official way to do it. And then at the same time, you're gonna start Cytoxan. Now, IV Cytoxan does not imply the dose is higher, so you can have High dose cytoxan, which is one gram per meter square, which would be the lupus dose for kidney or brain, or you can simply have the two milligram per kilogram dose, which is the dose for vasculitis. And that could be administered PO or IV. And if they're in the hospital, it probably works better and is, is absorbed better IV. So, okay. We don't like to keep people on cytoxan for more than about three months. If we have to, we'll give it to them six months. It's been pretty much found, and the reason for a lot of trials looking for other drugs is the long-term side effects of cytoxan, even more so than cancer, tend to be infections. And people who have vasculitic diseases who go into complete remissions and do very well, five years later die of some mucor mycosis or cystic sarcosis or brucellosis or some some endemic infection to where they went and you know nobody knew what they had and they died of an infection and that's probably this we gave them cytoxane just a little bit too long or a little bit too much um so usually what we do once somebody seems to be in clinical remission with most of these diseases is we switch them to imuran or azothioprine now imuran or azothioprine raises some interesting questions it's very well tolerated it's very safe but the TMPT gene, you can look up what it stands for. Um, the population at large is 3% homozygous for this gene. If you have somebody who's homozygous for TMPT gene, you shouldn't really give them Imuran unless you're gonna check their blood counts almost every day because there's a very high incidence of cytopenias, very bad cytopenias. Okay, so those are the main things you need to know about treatment of vasculitis. Now, there's a couple of other situations where you're gonna say, oh, that makes sense. Makes sense. So I'll, I'll throw one at you. If you have somebody with cryoglobulinemic vasculitis who's failed your typical uh, steroid cytoxan, you might say, well, gosh, cryoglobulinemia, well, what's going on there? So the first thing to realize, gee, cryoglobulins are just rheumatoid factors. Well, okay, a rheumatoid factor is an antibody. How am I gonna get rid of an antibody? So rituxan actually fills in nicely in a lot of the vasculitic diseases where there's an antibody-mediated antibody -mediated disease. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next slide. 
Um, okay, aortitis. Um, well, again, I'm trying to circle around on purpose so I can hit the same topics more than once. Aortitis, of course, means inflammation of the aorta. Um, now, the people who have hypertensive disease, they typically have abnormalities or aneurysms in the uh, abdominal aorta, the last I remember. But people who have vasculitic diseases, they may have it anywhere, but they have a predilection for the thoracic aorta. So if somebody uh, has thoracic aortic disease or aortitis, you're thinking of syphilis and vasculitis and Marfan's, you're not thinking about hypertension. But when somebody has an aneurysm in the abdominal aorta, you're not thinking about anything other than, gee, they must be some old hypertensive that's never been taken care of, and they probably have a lot of aortic vascular disease. And those people are at risk of uh, dissections and aneurysms and all the other complications that come along with arterial disease. So, um, if we kind of go through this list, there's a few things that are on this list that weren't on the other list that I'd like to mention at least, just so, again, I, I think it's important that you heard some of these things because um, they are important. Um, um, so, since you see a lot of things written here, I'm gonna make the first comment that almost everything can involve the aorta. But the diseases that I think about when I'm thinking about rheumatic diseases that involve the aorta, the aortic root, I'm thinking about Marfan syndrome, I'm thinking about other hypermobility disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos, um, the uh, form of Ehlers-Danlos is the vascular Ehlers-Danlos, uh, any of the other too numerous to count um, hypermobility disorders that can give uh, hyperelastic vessels. I'm also thinking about um, uh, Bichette's disease. Bichette's disease, which we're not going to talk about, is a disease of mouth and genital ulcers, but has a very high predilection for involving veins. So something worthy of noting. Not necessarily arteries, but that being said, uh, aortitis has been and is seen or can be seen in Bichette's disease or Bechet's as uh, my former colleague who's recently deceased, uh, Dr. George Ehrlich, would pronounce. Um, and relapsing polychondritis, there's a nice case report that I put on YouTube that I presented to the Clinical Congress of Rheumatology. Um, aortitis is definitely something uh, that is seen in relapsing polychondritis, so this would be a rheumatic disease where you get large vessel disease. So in lupus, you're not gonna get aortic disease. In rheumatoid arthritis and myositis, you're gonna probably not get aortic disease. Um, spondyloarthropathies, really what we're talking about there is we're talking about things like ankylosing spondylitis and its mimics and dilatation of the aortic root. But again, we're up to the thoracic aorta. We're also talking about um, aneurysms and dissections. Uh, sarcoid can also affect the aorta. Lupus probably shouldn't be on the list. And the one thing that I think is something that really should be mentioned is this guy. Anyone here heard of um, IgG4 disease? Okay, IgG4 disease is something that uh, us rheumatologists uh, have a lot of interest in. It's mediated by elevations in IgG4. It's becoming a very well written about constantly for the past five years. Something I'm on the lookout for, I've actually reached out to the local GI people and asked them to send me uh, their unexplained pancreatitis patients. So the IgG4 syndrome uh, is an autoimmune disease with elevated IgG4 with autoimmune pancreatitis, autoimmune sialadenitis, or a large parotid gland, and aortitis, and also can have uh, um, retroperitoneal fibrosis. Okay, we go to the next slide. I don't know what's gonna end first, me falling asleep for the slides. Okay, so again, we're sort of re-summarizing, and uh, you see the large aorta, and that's the uh, large vessel diseases. PAN is the medium vessel disease. And the small vessels are typically more venous diseases, venules. Um, 
that's sort of a schematic of just uh, summarizing what we've already gone through a bunch of times. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, large vessel vasculitis. If we dim the lights, we may be able to see this a little bit better. We're right, right behind you on the wall. Okay, um, so what we see, can everyone see the microwave? What we see here, um, you can see you have a nice dilated, well, not dilated, but you have a normal vessel, and all of a sudden it becomes stenotic. Okay, so that's the finding there. There may be other findings, but at least you can visualize that pretty easily. Um, and I think what's supposed to be shown here, uh, the aneurysm, I gather, would be right here. It's too big there. I think the cutoff point for a traditional aneurysm in the abdominal aorta is about five and a half centimeters, but any aneurysm in the thoracic aorta where the pressure is really high is, uh, is of concern. Um, next. Okay, large vessel vasculitis. We've basically beaten this topic to death already. Uh, women to men, it occurs uh, at a mean age of about 74 years old. It is granulomatous also. So remember, they used to have a category of granulomatous vasculitic diseases, which was Wegner's and um, sarcoid and uh, Crohn's and uh, this, but they don't have that category. And also, the involvement of the um, carotid artery branches and, and any stigmata of that. Okay, next. Okay, again, we went through this already. Um, the visual loss is the biggest problem. The eye doctor has to look for the ischemic optic pruritus, fever, weight loss, proximal girdle pain for PMR, um, the tender, indurated um, temporal artery or no pulse, those are all ominous. Um, scalp tenderness is from scalp ischemia. Again, I think we've talked about this a lot. The key thing I would also throw in again is jaw claudication and tongue claudication of it are the most important um, most important features. Yeah, those are almost diagnostic if you see those features. Next. Um, okay, the slide uh, says here that it's positive in 50 to 80% of the cases. I would probably say it's positive in 10 to 90% of the cases because depending on who does it, where it's done, how much experience the pathologist has. But what you can see is um, you can see a very thickened, uh, very thickened muscle wall, and you have a huge inflammatory infiltrate here that's uh, filling up the vessel. Okay, next. And back to the treatment, we go to high dose steroids, we give aspirin, the outcome is usually very good. Okay, next. Uh, Takayasu is just throwing in some pictures now. Uh, you can see clearly that you have um, stenosis of the, uh, this must be the aorta, I gather. Here's the aorta, many branches, uh, but the stenosis, that's the main thing. And also, because there's um, narrowing in the aorta, this is one of these conditions where you want to check the pulses in both arms and both legs, and you want to make sure that you're not getting 140 over 60 here and 90 over 50 here. There's, there's clearly something wrong in that situation. The other one just showed, well this is catheter directed, and the other one just shows um, the, um, the, the less invasive form. A little bit more radiation perhaps in the CTA. Um, I can only say that it's there because it's not normal, but I guess this is probably meant to be an aneurysm right here. Can everyone see an aneurysm here? Okay, so at least you can see something. It's very important when you look at these studies, so really look at them very carefully and go step by step because there may be issues where, like actually now that I'm stepping back, um, you can see it's much, this is an aneurysm right here. It's a little bead and this here, like from here to here is one aneurysm, and then here's another aneurysm. This here is different, this is different. So the whole, the whole thing is, is abnormal. Okay, next. Um, okay, so we talked about a mesenteric arteriogram before when somebody has abdominal pain or hypertension to look at the vessels. Um, well, first, um, on the uh, angiogram, 
same thing. We're looking for dilatation, stenosis, and beating. Um, it looks like this is cheating and telling us where the problems are. Um, Okay, um, so what I see is abnormal, is I see dilatation here, and then I see some sort of drop out here, and then I see dilatation here, and drop out here. You guys appreciate that? I mean, we could probably dissect this and you know study it for a couple of days, but as long as you see some abnormalities. And then on the biopsy, that's a sural nerve biopsy, and um, what, you're, what you're supposed to gather out of the sural nerve biopsy is, well, for one, that's what a normal nerve looks like, but the nerve is surrounded by blue. So remember back to med school, blue is bad. So if the nerve is surrounded by inflammatory cells, there's clearly an inflammatory reaction going on with that nerve. Now, the sural nerve, fortunately, is not necessary, so to have it cut out is not particularly ominous to any patient. Okay, next. Uh, Medium vessel vasculitis, we've already talked about PAN almost in its entirety. I talked about um, the GI tract with the, the infarction of bleeding. I talked about the hypertension. I talked about the monomeritis multiplex. I talked about the constitutional symptoms. Uh, I didn't mention the, the digital infarct, but uh, anybody who's not getting blood to the hands or feet are going to infarct the hands or feet. Um, next, with PAN, you're going to get, like with any other vasculitis, you're going to get elevated acute phase reactants. Um, you're going to get uh, sed rate, C-reactive protein. Sed rate is derived from fibrinogen. Uh, you're going to be anemic. You might have uh, elevations of white counter platelets. There may be LFT abnormalities. That dates back to the uh, hepatitis B association of PAN. The diagnosis is typically angiography or biopsy. The treatment is steroid and cytoxan. We've gone through, we've gone through this already. Uh, small vessel vasculitis. Um, now basically we see glomerular nephritis, we see alveolar hemorrhage, and so now we're really back into the anchor diseases. Um, although there's no reason that we can't say that one of these is uh, henoxoline purpura, which is now known as IgA vasculitis. I'm going to keep repeating the new name so that you can sound smart on rounds and, and challenge your attendings and tell them, no, 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 there's no henoxoline anymore, it's been renamed. Um, anyway, so. You have a, a red cell cast up there on the top right, so when you see a red cell cast, you have glomerulonephritis usually. And on the bottom, um, you have a kidney biopsy. So I'm not a renal pathologist, but I can tell you uh, for, for certain, this is an abnormal renal biopsy. You don't see too many glomeruli. You see a big cluster of cells here. And you have all this, this whole area is fibrotic tissue. So you have one glomeruli, maybe you have two that are coalesced, tons of cells, um, an abnormal basement membrane, and lots of fibrosis. So again, I don't claim to be a, I don't profess to be a renal pathologist, but I hope you guys have seen a renal biopsy before and understand that this renal biopsy is very abnormal and consistent with glomerulonephritis. Now, if you said to me, gee, how can you prove that this renal biopsy is not lupus? Then the answer is, well, gee, you know, in the lupus uh, biopsy, you have what's called a, um, a full house uh, immunofluorescence, where C1Q, C3, um, IgG, uh, IgM, all, all the, all the uh, immunofluorescence light up. These are known as posse immune, so there's very few or no immune deposits. Um, so now we have the lung. So the CAT scan shows these fluffy infiltrates that are alveolar, and now on the uh, biopsy you see blood and hemorrhage all over the place. So here's tons of inflammatory cells and blood everywhere else. And in those red areas, there should be nothing. There should be air. Okay, next. Okay, so back to um, our Wegner's, which is now GPA. Again, we have upper respiratory, you have the sinus, um, you have the lung and you have the renal. We've, we've already clearly discussed this, um, so we can go on to the next one. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about ANCA. Everyone needs to know that ANCA exists. Everyone needs to know a little bit about ANCA. Um, for, for your purposes, there's two ANCAs. There's well, ANCA is anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, and there's P-ANCA and C-ANCA. And as I said before, 
When you want your specific ANCA, you must order that ANCA by ELISA. So if you suspect Wegner's or GPA, you need to order the, um, the protonase 3 or PR3 antibody by ELISA. If the PR3 antibody by ELISA is positive in the right clinical setting, then you can probably say that person has that disease. You might say, well, gee, it's vasculitis. What about the biopsy? It really depends on the clinical scenario. There are some, cir some circumstances you might be able to get away without a biopsy, and in other circumstances, you might have to get a biopsy. Um, I'm going to save more details about ANCA until later, and if I forget, uh, that will remind me to make a few comments about ANCA and the RAVE trial and how uh, ANCA can and can't be used in monitor monitoring disease and diagnosing disease. So um, the one thing I want you to see here, and this is clearly something we see on room boards. I don't think they would show it on medicine boards, certainly not family medicine boards. But the P ANCA has the peripheral staining. That's pretty obvious. And the um, cytoplasmic, the cytoplasm is stained. So anyway, OK. So next slide. Um, OK, so the PR3, which is the um, one specific for GPA or Wegner's, and then the MPO, which is the uh, myeloperoxidase, or the one specific for microscopic PAN, and is commonly seen in church strauss And there used to be a condition which is no longer in the nomenclature, which was called renal-limited vasculitis, or vasculitis limited to the kidney, where you simply see plus articular GM. But anyway, um, the whole point of this slide is to let you know that in Wegner's, you can see either one, even though the, the PR3 is the diagnostic one. And in microscopic PAN or, Milo or NPO, you can see either one or both. But again, uh, the, as you see, the NPO has up to 80% of the uh, P anchor, or I don't want to say P anchor because if you order the anchor at the hospital by IFA, it might say P anchor. But if you don't get an ELISA and the MPO is negative, you don't have a true PANCA. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. Uh, and the same for the PR3. In Wegner's, it's up to 90% positive, OK? And by the way, if you notice at the end, all the diseases can be negative for ANCA. So we're not treating blood tests. We're, we're using these as guides to help us. OK, next. <clears throat> all right, so the key things regarding um, ANCA, let's see. So can ANCA be used to diagnose Wegener's granulomatosis, also now known as GPA? The answer is no. Why? Because it's just a blood test, and we know that 20% of Wegener's or GPA patients do not have ANCA. Um, it can be helpful. It can be diagnostic. It just depends on the clinical scenario. I have a patient in my practice who has a positive PR3 for two years every month at 640. When she first presented, and now that she's in remission, she always has 640. So she's, she's proof enough for me that the test really doesn't mean a whole lot. Because frankly, her clinical scenario of uh, sinuses, lungs, and kidneys was good enough for me to know that she had a vasculitic disorder. But it was easier to do this and have things make sense, rather than sending her for a lot of biopsies that she didn't want to have. Um, OK, next. OK, do ankle levels indicate active vasculitis? No, they do not. This has been studied and studied again and again and again by multiple authors that are well-published, academic people, big medical centers all over the country, all over the world. ANCA cannot be used in its value to predict the outcome, the treatments, or anything else. It is like a set rate. It can be helpful under the correct clinical setting. Um, let's see. So an individual patient, in individual patients, ANCA does not correlate with disease activity. That's not to say that it can't occasionally, but you cannot bet the farm on it. It's just not true. And definitely should not be used to guide the treatment. Again, just like you would never use your set rate to guide the treatment of a polyarteritis patient. I'm sorry. A, um, a giant cell arteritis patient. Now, I'll make one point about that. The normal set rate in an 80-year-old woman is 50. So the lady comes in with a headache and a set rate of 90. Well, 
so what? What does that mean? I don't know. Does she have a headache? Does she have jaw claudication? Do you really think that she has GCA? Okay, maybe you're convinced. So you give her lots of steroids, and she says, I feel great. And you check her sed rate, and it's 75. Well, she responded, but 75 may be normal for her, I don't know. So again, you, you can't rely on tests. You have to rely on your history, your physical, and what the patient tells you. And if you have a patient with a stroke and they can't talk, you could try to get a pattern of how a sed rate plays out. And the same would go for ANCA testing, and that's why I give you that example. Okay, next. Okay, Wegner's. Um, again, fortunately, we've already talked about most of this stuff. So the diagnosis is typically by biopsy. Um, Pawsey immune. Pawsey immune means you're going to have less immune deposits as opposed to lupus and other immune complex diseases. Um, prednisone and cytoxan is the treatment of choice, but we are going to discuss what is called the RAVE trial, and I think everyone needs to know about the RAVE trial because the RAVE trial actually compared um, about 150 people or so. Um, they put one group of uh, GPA patients on cytoxan and prednisone, and they put another group of people on rituxan or rituximab and prednisone. And the conclusion of the trial was that for induction, not remission maintenance, but induction, the results were equal, okay? So now if you are like me and you believe that old is gold and we shouldn't be changing things if they work, you'd still believe that the treatment of choice for an acute case of Wegner's or GPA is in fact cytoxan with high dose steroids. And after three to six months of cytoxan, you will then convert the patient to perhaps methotrexate, perhaps azothioprine. That being said, since the results were equal, and the patient who may not be able to take cytoxan for whatever reason or doesn't want to, that person should be able to get an equal induction of remission with rituxan. 375 milligram per kilogram, the same protocol that would be given for the lymphoma treatments. No difference at all. Next slide. Okay. Um, I want, again, I threw this slide in there because, I, again, I wanted to pull things around and show you the same stuff yet classified differently. So pulmonary renal syndromes. First thing I think about, pulmonary renal, pulmonary renal syndrome, oh my. Patients coughing up blood, patients kidneys are failing, failing, their creatinine clearance is going down, their creatinine is going up. They have red cell casts, things are just horrible, they're dying. But actually, we have a differential diagnosis. Well, we know it can't be PAN, right? Because I've already told you four times that PAN spares the lungs and spares the kidneys. So that's one good thing, you know. So anyway, um, how do we distinguish these diseases? Well, good pasture syndrome is a, uh, is a pulmonary renal syndrome of young men, usually teenagers, 18-year-olds, and the distinguishing feature in those patients is they have linear immunofluorescence, linear, as opposed to lupus, which can give the same clinical presentation except granular immunofluorescence. So if you know nothing else from this lecture, know that GBM disease is linear and lupus is granular, and on the boards, if you have that choice, at least you'll get that question right. And they both can give you pulmonary renal syndrome, exact same clinical scenario. Same thing for cryoglobulinemia. And again, the difference is in the biopsy. You will see cryoglobulin deposits. And then you have the um, ANCA diseases. You have GPA and MPA. Diagnosis on biopsy, palsy immune with positive um, uh, ELISA studies for PR3 or MPO respectively. Okay, next. 
small vessel vasculitis. Way back at the beginning, I told you that small vessels involve the skin often, and if they involve the skin, they often involve palpable purpura. I don't necessarily know if I would pick this rash and call it palpable, palpable purpura. But what I would know is that if this patient came to me and they had some sort of a illness, I would get a skin biopsy and I would look for the term leukocytoplastic vasculitis and I would want to know what the immunofluorescence was. Okay, next. Small vessel vasculitis, again, the key thing is that it's, it often involves the skin. The term is leukocytoplastic vasculitis or some people use the term leukocytoplasia. Um, let's see. They make the comment, don't overtreat, because uh, that it's not necessarily life threatening. There's probably some truth to that, and there's probably some not truth to that. Um, hmm. Certainly, we beat this topic to death that with another process, you're going to see this. Many drugs, many, many, many drugs give skin rashes, give purpura, give small, small skin rashes. Many infections. Um, the one that always comes into my mind that should never be overlooked is parvo. Rashes, vasculitis, arthritis. School teachers get it. Moms of young children get it. Very common. Epstein Barr, CMV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV. These are the common ones. Malignancy, again, usually lymphoma, but a lot of the um, myeloproliferative and CML, these categories, and the, the different uh, acute leukemias all give these rashes too. Okay, next. Mr. Sonnery, some of us have to leave to sign out, if you don't mind. So whoever's not on medicine needs to sign out. Okay. Just so you know, we are pretty much coming to the end. We're, we're just about summarizing. The last couple of slides are just a couple of pictures from the office. And I believe we've covered everything that's in these last few slides. So the medicine people will say, just like the interns that have to go sign out. I'm, I'm just letting you know we're probably five minutes from finishing. And anybody who wants to stay and ask questions is welcome. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has to leave, please, you're allowed, I guess. If you'd like to stay and hear what I have to say for five minutes, I'll be done quickly. Okay, anyway, so I mentioned these again because they're very important. I want you to kind of remember these things. I hope you leave with the fact that cholesterol emboli is somebody who's had a vasculitic appearance within 30 days of a um, catheter procedure. It's not within the first three hours. It can last up to a month after the procedure. They mimic vasculitis 100%. The diagnosis is based on biopsy. Calciphylaxis is your chronic dialysis patient who presents with these painful, violaceous plaques all over their body, usually abdomen and flanks in the, in the fatty adipose areas. Um, the Coumadin skin necrosis is the protein, protein C deficiency. They start Coumadin. A few days later, they have uh, a horrific vasculitic looking picture. Endocarditis and lymphoma can mimic anything. Next. Um, we can skip this. Recognition of vasculitis. This should only tell you that everything can be involved. Skin, eyes, ears, nose, throat, lungs, kidneys, GI, and neuro. We've, we've definitely talked enough about that. Next. Um, the assessment we've definitely talked about. I'll just say, uh, without looking at the slide, you need an accurate history. It's the most important thing. If you need a good physical exam, you should always check and look at the urine. You should always get a chest x-ray. You should always check a CBC, liver functions, albumin, uh, rheumatoid factor, ANCA, uh, and anything else that we discussed today that is pertinent to what disease you think you're looking for. And don't forget blood cultures, and uh, don't forget the other concomitant health problems, the, the comorbidities. Next. Um, again, the assessment of vasculitis, we've, we've said this five times, it's uh, angiogram or biopsy. Next. Um, recognizing vasculitis, I've already mentioned this. Um, rash, pulmonary hemorrhage, glomerular nephritis, digital infarcts, 
mononeuritis, um, multi-organ disease is something we didn't mention, but that's a situation you'll think of this. Um, a rapidly progressive problem with an organ that you're not sure why. Uh, and the other thing that isn't mentioned here is um, extreme constitutional symptoms that are going on. Next. Uh, what do you do if you suspect vasculitis? Uh, you can call a rheumatologist. Um, again, you take a good history, you take your physical exam, you get all your studies, and then if you do suspect vasculitis, you know, the reality of the situation is it depends on the who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, if you suspect in your office that a patient has giant cell arteritis, do not let them leave without giving them a lot of steroids or getting them to somebody who treats this condition as fast as humanly possible because you could and should be sued for delaying treatment on somebody who you could have prevented their blindness or their stroke. Uh, the other conditions, I will tell you that generally speaking, they need to be admitted to the hospital. If you have an infusion center like I do, I have literally walked people down the hall who have walked in that day with foot drop or wrist drop and started infusing them immediately. I've had this discussion with um, what I'll call vasculopathy doctors and they treat nothing but vasculitis in research settings. I believe that if I've caught these people with foot drop or wrist drop prior to them developing glomerulonephritis or pulmonary hemorrhage or abdominal pain or catastrophe, and I pulse them with steroids and start cytoxane immediately, while I may not have had enough time to correct their foot drop or wrist drop, because those are usually permanent, um, they may never develop the GI renal or, or any other symptoms or stigmata of disease. This can't be proven, but in my own little small cohort of people that I walk down the hall who walk in the office who clearly have mononeuritis multiplex, um, we have a couple of happy people that know they otherwise would have died if they had to wait a month for treatment uh, going through the ER and the whole system. Next. Um, are, are these now the pictures from the yeah. office? Okay, so the last six slides are just pictures from the office. Okay, this is another picture from the office. picked a good selection of pictures because yeah okay this this one I can tell you this is a patient who um, if you looked at it and you weren't sure you might say gee it looks like pyoderma gangliosum but in fact this is somebody with dermal PAN or dermal polyarthritis <coughs> polyarthritis nodosum as as based on biopsy um, the other one before this looked like psoriasis and I think the first two were meant to be small vessel vasculitis that just looks like cellulitis or perhaps there's a um, lack of flow to the foot. Um, those are supposed to be digital ulcers in people with ischemic toes. And you can see uh, that the um, pad of the toe is purple compared with the rest of the foot, which is normal skin color. Um, that would also be, a, this is a situation here where you have um, such bad periomal erythema from vasculitis that they're rotting off the skin and you really don't even need to do an alcohol capillary exam because you can almost see with the naked eye these dilated capillary loops uh, without doing alcohol capillaroscopy. Next. Um, those are digital infarcts clearly from ischemia. Uh, those could be seen in um, scleroderma as well as vasculitis. The next one is a splinter hemorrhage. You can see this in endocarditis, uh, any thrombotic or embolic disease. And I'll tell you one, uh, one last uh, gift for the boards is uh, trichinosis is the condition that gives the most splinter hemorrhages. Uh, and this is a small vessel vasculitic rash. This is something that I would commonly look at and say, oh, that's palpable purpura or some small vessel vasculitis, and then try to piece the whole picture together. And one of the problems that I always have is whether to treat them preemptively, which uh, makes it difficult to make a definitive diagnosis, or try to withhold knowing, gee, they're not going to die from the rash. But you see, Small vessel diseases can present in medium vessel fashion, and medium vessel vascular, medium vessel disease 
can present in small vessel fashion. So sometimes you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. So if you can't get biopsies and angiograms right away, I don't think it's wrong to treat immediately. The worst you can do is tell the patient, you're going to do better, but I don't know what you have. That might be the last one. No. Oh, this, this slide is actually nothing to do with anything. It's just a uh, person in the office who I took a picture of their eye because they had um, a nevus in their eye. Not even a malignancy. This is one of my patients with lupus. Um, I think this patient has a, if you've ever seen in the hospital, the lady that comes in with lupus and sweet syndrome, when she first presented, she presented with um, um, nail hemorrhages and the infarct. Uh, this slide doesn't necessarily look familiar, but it says they're aptus ulcers. You can see ulcers in many things, including vasculitis. Um, lupus vasculitis. You can't tell if it's a foot or a scalp. We can go on balls. What is it? This is the foot? first metatarsal. Okay, so somebody has uh, a callus that's hiding ischemia, I guess. Okay, so this is. Uh, this is an interesting picture because what you have is um, you have profound periungal erythema, which you can see in any vasculitic disorder. You can see it in lupus, you can see it in scleroderma. Um, without a biopsy or a clinical history, you're not going to know what it is, but um, this finding should definitely alert you that something is very wrong and that this isn't some, somebody who burned their fingers. I think we can skip this because I don't know anything more to say about it. Uh, Church Strauss, which is now um, E for eosinophilic GPA. This slide has arrows pointing at eosinophils, which are, when they're magnified better, are very pretty looking white cells. And so you have large infiltrates of eosinophils. Um, okay, so this is Coumadin skin necrosis. So if you saw this rash, you might pass out, but you should at least recognize that in a patient who's on Coumadin and who started it in the last three to five days, who has a protein C deficiency, that this vasculitic mimic is in fact nothing more than the need to stop Coumadin. Oh, okay, this is um, one of the people who I mentioned to you that came in this week, and she's sitting in my infusion room right now. Well, right now in the picture. So she walked in and she said, um, my wrist doesn't move for eight days. And um, I said, what have you done? She said, I went to my family doctor and I said, what did he say? And she said, he told me I broke my wrist. I said, does your wrist hurt? She said, no. So what did he do? He gave me a splint. What else did he do? Nothing. So I kept calling every day. My wrist doesn't move, it doesn't move, it doesn't move. I went to the emergency room, it's not broken. Well, are you sure? Maybe it's broken. Then she was told, um, go see a neurologist. I think she ran into a friend. Her friend said, go to Dr. Soloway. She came. So I said, um, oh gee, this is wrist drop. Okay, no big deal, wrist drop, but she's now had it for like eight, nine days. I said, we're gonna walk down the hall and I have to start treating very aggressively immediately because this is probably gonna be permanent. Well, she did in fact get motion back in her fingers, but she still has wrist drops, so she can do this instead of just this. And actually, that's, sadly, that's a, that's a success story, but we probably treated her early enough where she won't develop GI, renal, um, uh, mesenteric, eyes, scalp, nothing. And if you ask me what do I think she has, now that I know all her blood tests are normal, I would have to say she has PAN. But this is one of those people where she doesn't fulfill the criteria for PAN, but I also treated her within five minutes of meeting her. So she's not going to have a chance to develop any of the other features that would have perhaps developed or killed her within six months. Because the death rate in PAN is very high at six months. Okay, if anyone's awake, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if 
if we have some questions. I tried to repeat things on purpose three and four times because I realized this might be the first time you've ever heard of these topics, and the topics are very important topics. Okay, so first everyone's awake, right? Okay, good. I didn't bore you, right? Okay, good. Um, you must want to know something, certainly. I mean, you, you have boards coming up, right? You can't know everything about vasculitis, and I mean, most things you do, but not everything. Okay, well, maybe you do know everything about vasculitis. No, I don't. <laughs> When you do give um, pulse high dose steroids, how much do you usually give? The standard pulse steroid is 1,000 milligrams a day for three days. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's very very standard of care. Basic. Uh, probably I've done it once a month for my entire career. And. Um, when you see somebody who's really sick and you're not really sure what they have, it's very safe to come along and just give them a dose of uh, gram of cytoxin at the same time. I don't even think twice about it, even if they're 20 years old. I guess we're done, unless somebody has a question. I think I covered as much as I could possibly cover without myself falling asleep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.